Welcome everyone to the second event of the Ukrainian Indigenous Relationship Building Initiative. My name is Marina Chernyavska, and together with Leah Hertzun, uh, I will be your co-host co for tonight's event. I would like to start with uh, paying respects and acknowledging the land where we are situated. Uh, I am privileged to live, work, and learn on uh, the banks of the beautiful North Saskatchewan River in Maskwachi, uh, Waskahikan, uh, on Treaty 6 territory, traditional gathering place, a traveling route, and home for many Indigenous peoples, and also integral part of Métis mobility. Uh, we welcome everyone. Thank you for your interest. Thank you for joining us tonight. I would like to remind you uh, about uh, the first event that happened with this, within this initiative in January tw uh, 2021. It was Leah Hertzun's presentation. If you didn't have a chance to attend that event, uh, it is available online. The recording is available online and uh, the link to the presentation has been just pasted in the chat for your convenience. So go ahead and uh, watch it if you're interested. Tonight's event will be also recorded and we will make it available uh, for the public at a later date as well. Uh, this initiative is a joint initiative between the Ukrainian Resource and Development Center at McKeown University and Cool Focal Center at the University of Alberta. My colleague and dear friend, Larissa Hajduk, uh, uh, who is director at URDC, uh, is coordinating this initiative on McKeown's side and I represent the Cool Focal Center and we also have three um, other uh, brilliant women who are part of this uh, working group of the initiative, and they're all here today. Uh, it's uh, Leah Hertzun, Chelsea Vowell, and Verna Kostas, whom I'm honored to work along with. Um, just a few housekeeping items. Um, you are welcome to use chat, and many of you are using it, I see. To send messages, you can send messages to panelists only or to all uh, attendees and panelists, including. But if you want to ask a question or uh, share a comment with the presenters, please use a Q&A button. Uh, we will ask questions at the end of the presentation and we may miss something in the chat, but we will watch closely Q&A um, section. So please paste your questions in that part. And on this, I would like to turn it over to Leah to introduce our speakers. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, David first. David Garneau, who is Métis, is a professor of visual arts at the history, sorry, <laughs> professor of visual arts at the University of Regina. His practice includes painting, curation, and critical writing. He is interested in creative expressions in contemporary indigenous identities. Garneau recently curated Kawa Siretati, the Contemporary Native Art Biennale in Montreal 2020. With assistance from Faye Mullen and Rudy Acker, co curated with Kathleen Ash Milby, Transformer Native Art in Light and Sound, National Museum of the American Indian, New York 2017 with Secrecy and Despatch with Tess Allen, an international exhibition about massacres of indigenous people and memorialization for the Campbelltown Art Center, Sydney, Australia in 2016. He has also curated Moving Forward, Never Forgetting with Michelle Lavallee, an exhibition concerning the legacies of Indian residential schools, other forms of aggressive assimilation, and reconciliation at the Mackenzie Art Gallery in Regina in 2015. His paintings are in numerous public and in private collections. It's also my pleasure to introduce Sandra to you. Sandra Semchuk is a photographer and scholar. She's a second generation Ukrainian Canadian who was a 2018 Governor General Award recipient in visual and media arts. Semchuk has focused her photographic and video work on relationships between herself, her family, and her community. She collaborated with her late husband, James Nicholas, Cree writer and orator, on photographic, text, and video works to disrupt, to disrupt myths that have shaped settler relations to First Nations. 
A major exhibition of these collaborations is currently at the McKenzie Art Gallery in Regina and will travel nationally. Recent photographic and video works engage the wider than human, the forest, and the overtone singing of Jerry Devoin to provide a larger context for local, global human narratives, personal and collective stories. Her artist's book, The Stories Were Not Told, Canada's First World War Internment Camps, creates a space for internees and descendants to tell their stories. Today, we also have Chelsea with us, who will be the moderator. Um, and I will take a moment to introduce Chelsea as well. So Chelsea Bowell is Métis from Manitou Sagahigan, or Lac St. Anne, Alberta. She's res currently residing in Amiskwichi, Wiskahigan, or Edmonton. She is the mother to six girls. She has a B.Ed., an LLB, and an MA, and is a Cree language instructor at the Faculty of Native Studies at the University of Alberta. Chelsea is a public intellectual, a writer, and an educator whose work intersects language, gender, Métis self-determination, and resurgence. Author of Indigenous Rights, a guide to First Nations, Métis, and Inuit issues in Canada, she and her co-host Molly Swain produced Indigenous feminist sci-fi podcast, Métis in Space, and, has, and she has co-founded the Métis in Space Land Trust. Chelsea blogs at apitawigosisan.com and makes legendary Bannock. Thank you all very much for being with us today. So am I up? Yeah, let's let's start with you, David, and okay. uh, tell us a little bit about everything, all the amazing things that you're doing. <laughs> well, first of all, I want to thank, uh, it was Myrna Kostash who invited me originally to join up here, and I couldn't imagine doing this without Sandra Semchuk, who I'm in conversation with uh, through a number of things. We, I forgot when we first met up, but uh, we reintroduced ourselves at the TRC event in Vancouver a number of years back, and then I curated her work in an exhibition I'll talk about shortly. And I'm also writing about her for the essay, or for the uh, show that's at the McKenzie right now. And uh, so I want to start actually, and thank you for Leah and Mariana, and of course yourself, Chelsea, for uh, hosting this. Um, I, I want to deepen the acknowledge a little bit in the center from where I'm living now and then um, where I grew up in Edmonton. So right now I'm speaking from Muscana, Regina in Treaty 4, where I'm a grateful guest. I've been here for about 22 years. The treaties, the numbered treaties are legal and sacred covenants between the crown and the original inhabitants and stewards of the Great Plains and North Central Woodlands of the territory now known as Canada. The crown is the legal name of the British government whose rights in this matter were transferred to Canada's crown at Confederation without consultation of Indigenous peoples. According to British law, Canada's legal existence depended upon securing written settlements with the people who are here first. Treaty four was signed in, that's the treaty where I'm at, you're at uh, treaty uh, six. Treaty four was signed in 1874 and it's an agreement between on one side settlers, their heirs, and anyone accepting the social contract of becoming a Canadian. And on the other side, people then known as Indians, in this case, the Nahewak, that's the Cree, the Anishinaabeg, the Soto, the Dakota, Lakota, and Dakota, also known as Assiniboian people. The spirit of the treaties is that in exchange for sharing their land, First Nations people are compensated, have reserved lands, and special rights in perpetuity. Elders understand that the treaty is with the creator it's a sacred obligation that includes our other than human relations. For indigenous people, the idea of title to land and its surrender is inconceivable. Treaty is an agreement to share responsibility. I also want to acknowledge that in addition to treaty signatories, this area was shared at various times by the Métis, the Blackfoot, but also ancient others, and now host Inuit and people from many nations. I recognize the elders, knowledge keepers, and land protectors, and culture producers, past and present. Uh, so I'll mention very quickly that I'm a descendant of Métis Riverlot people, Eleanor and Laurent Garneau, 
on whose lands the University of Regina slowly encroaches. Uh, they moved here or there in 1872 from Red River. And I was also born and raised in that city. So now I'm going to share my screen, if I can do this properly. Just could somebody acknowledge that this is showing up? We can see your slides. Beautiful, thank you very much. So I've got an awful lot of slides. I'm gonna whistle through them and uh, I'm gonna linger longer on a few things uh, just so that if people wanna refer back to them later. Uh, I do a lot of work, as was mentioned. I mostly conceive of myself as a painter and I also write and I curate uh, mostly, at least in the last little while, um, with an accomplice, uh, always an Indigenous woman artist to keep me on my toes. And this is uh, my beginnings. I began in the 1970s uh, seeing Joe Fafard's work in uh, the art gallery of Ed the Edmonton Art Gallery. I lived at the Edmonton Art Gallery in the Edmonton Public Library in Churchill Square. Uh, that was my, my hub. I grew up on the, just on the downtown edge of uh, Edmonton on the west side there, 124th Street. And I wanted to be Joe really, really badly. Uh, I was in Edmonton in 1980 and was making these sculptures called the Boyle Street Boys, which were mostly men living rough and having difficulties on the street who were my friends. And uh, I played chess with them. I heard all their stories. This is me at 17 or almost 18, uh, showing at the Bear Claw Gallery. And the uh, author of this uh, wonderful um, journal, uh, Edmonton Journal article, which uh, said that I had trouble with women, it says in the small print, that really is something you need plastered around the city at that young tender age. Um, but she comes to me and she says, oh, really nice work, blah, blah, blah. And uh, you're Métis, eh? And I said, what? I had never heard that word before. I didn't know what she was referring to. And she says, well, Garneau, are you a descendant of Laurent and Eleanor? I said, yeah, they're my great, great grandparents. And she said, and look around, you know, we're in an indigenous gallery, the Bear Claw Gallery. And you know where you're about to faint, like everything drops and you're hearing, lose your hearing. <laughs> I was like in a state of shock because our family talked about, you know, indigenous uh, heritage, but not Métis. There were just all these family stories, including Laurent and Eleanor Garneau stories. And this was a place that I felt comfortable with. This is where my art should be. But the idea that that was my identity was a profound shock. So of course I went and talked to my dad about it. He says, yeah, what do you think? And later, I think the book uh, One and a Half Men came out a year or two later after I graduated high school. And uh, it was sort of the story that begins with Laurent Garneau. It's about Jim Brady and uh, the, all the um, settlements and, and getting Métis rights in Alberta. But uh, there was this family connection to this larger history beyond personal stories was a shock to me. So here's Eleanor, famous for her hats, and Laurent sitting down there. So they came from Red River in around 1872-73. Uh, they had to leave because they were, he was involved with the Red River resistance. And in 1885, he was accused of being involved with the um, Batash resistance. He was certainly a friend and confidant of Riel. And uh, troops came to arrest him. He had already gotten wind and, and snuck out down the river. There's some stories, funny stories about that. And his wife, the story goes, took incriminating letters from Riel and as the troops were coming up to arrest him, were washing him in her uh, washboard. Uh, he was a, initially, so his property was uh, right here, right next to the university uh, or the university starting to grow more and more on it. High level bridge is right here. Here's the old Fort Edmonton. And uh, uh, you can't see it, but just off this way is the Papa Chase land. Of course, all of this was Papa Chase land, but that was their, the land that they were granted in, in um, their adhesion to Treaty 6. And uh, when the troops finally arrested uh, my great great grandfather, he was in jail for about six months and he had 11 kids and Chief Papa Chase took care of them, took them in for that time so they didn't starve to death. It was a very raucous time. In the end, he ended up, he and his family at the turn of the century, you know, 15 years later, moved up to uh, uh, St. Paul, which was called St. Paul de Metis, which was a Metis reserve, basically. Uh, and that didn't last long. It fell apart for various reasons. Uh, 
actually, I don't need to talk about that. Um, but Chief Pappas Chase, um, Laurent uh, found out later in the 19 teens that Chief Pappas Chase was getting to be an old man and down on his luck. And uh, so um, he called for him, he built him, Garneau had gotten some, you know, uh, got into business, made a lot of money and uh, built a cabin for him and his family, Pappas Chase, and so he could end his life with respect up there. Um, so I'm interested in a number of things. I differentiate reconciliation from conciliation. Reconciliation is actually a right in the Catholic Church, and it refers to people who sin against God, against the church, um, separating themselves or being separated from the church and have to sort of win their way back in. And it assumes that you had a conciliation to begin with and that you reconcile. It's, a, it's an act that follows after an agreement. Whereas there's a question of whether we have conciliation. I'm mostly interested in the idea of reconciliation between indigenous peoples. And so this was an early painting I did in the maybe 2003. This is with uh, Bob Boyer and me and Bob Boyer and I are both uh, Métis and he's a uh, dance powwow. So what does it mean to bring these two aspects of this identity together? So I made an effort uh, probably about six, seven years ago to connect with Chief Papas Chase's descendants. So this is the current chief of the Papas Chase people, Calvin Bruno. And he and I have done a number of presentations and worked on various projects together. And I'll talk about the Tuatana Bridge project that uh, he helped me with. But so reconciliation for me is uh, restoring these relations between the Métis and the Cree, particularly in the site of my birth and growing up in Edmonton. I'm throwing this in because this just happened. I came to Regina from Calgary in uh, 1999. I couldn't believe it. There's a statue of John A in the city, right in the middle. So this is the city where rail was hung and there's a statue of John A. That's coincidence you might say, but there's not a statue anywhere else in Saskatchewan. There isn't one in Alberta. There isn't one in Manitoba. There isn't one in BC. There was one in Victoria, and then as an act of reconciliation, uh, the city, it was right outside the city hall, they removed it. And so when I moved here, I was quite shocked. So every year on November 16th, the anniversary of Rail's execution, I put a little noose at the bottom of his feet. And one year I put a really big one. Oh, I think I have a picture of it, a big one. And uh, just, it was my own private thing. And then about seven years ago, I decided that I should do something more public. So I worked with the Dunlop Art Gallery and oh, oh, before that, I would go into Walmart, collect these toys of Johnny McDonald, prize open the pack and sneak in a noose and then put them back on the shelf. Um, that was again, this is just sort of private thing. Uh, so I, I won't go into the present, what I did, but it basically I, I had a, a real suit made and I, I uh, just had an encounter with this statue. Mute, I didn't talk and uh, surprisingly John A who was known as an orator, didn't talk to me. Uh, so, you know, it didn't go so well. And uh, after this performance I did in Regina, then I did it in Kingston, the home of uh, John A, or at least where his uh, offices were. He was actually born in Scotland. And then I also did it in Ottawa on Canada 150. Um, I, uh, a few years later, I did another version. I had two suits made, so I had to get use out of the second one. And again, it was a private, I mean, a, a public presentation. This time I talked and I was encouraging John A to join me, Riel, in the museum. I'm not for creating a Riel statue to sort of counteract or balance off the narrative at all. So I just said we both ought to retire because I'm not a big fan of uh, idol idolatry for Riel either. Anyways, happy to say that last week they took down the statue. Um, so moving forward, never forgetting was an exhibition I put together with uh, Michelle Lavallee, uh, a large exhibition about Indian residential schools. I had um, decided for this show, it was gonna be only indigenous people. And then Michelle Lavallee showed me this work of uh, James Nicholas and Sandra Semchuk. And I was floored. I didn't think such a thing was possible, particularly this piece here. And um, I would do a tour of the show and I would always spend time with this one because I'd see something new each time. And I'm so grateful that Timothy Long has allowed me to write about it 
And I finally almost finished the essay today, sent it to Sandra for her thoughts. But it, it, there's this layer upon layer and this notion of conciliation, creative conciliation between two people uh, from different cultures and how you can come together. It doesn't transcend the differences, but it encompasses, it embraces, it allows both to flourish. Um, anyways, I, I could wrap poetic about it, but uh, better in writing than in than live. And then I hopefully Sandra will talk about her piece with uh, Skina Reese, which I saw in the witness show in Vancouver. And again, my my stomach dropped at how perfect, how beautiful, how much this is an indication of the shape of things to come. Um, Oh, I'm not good. Well, I'm going to talk about this for a sec. So I did a video just a couple of years after hers. I think it's in 98, 99. I worked at a somewhat like an Indian residential school in Edmonton called the Atonement Home, run by Franciscan nuns. They had the nuns floor, the girls floor, the boys floor, just like a residential school, except their school was down the street. And uh, I actually, I can't even talk about it. So this was an incident that I was involved with and um, decided to make a video about it. You know, 25 years later, I was uh, working at Lac St. Anne actually. They have right next to the sacred site, the Atonement Home Camp was there. And, um, oh, basically there was this boy this from Northern uh, Alberta for Chippewan who was five years old, who was swearing all the times. And he was very creative. I remember the sexual, the nuns anyways didn't like it and so they asked me to feed him a spoonful of black pepper that he had to hold in his mouth and I did it and my reconciliation was the public confession through this video so I asked this young man Corey Cardinal who would be like that boy grown up 20 years later just to stand there at a wall and listen to the story as I told him what happened and um, yeah so that was that. So it was mentioned earlier about the tree. So this is the tree, the Garneau tree that was planted in about 1874 at the edge of the Garneau property, which is now the edge of the University of Alberta hub parking lot. And um, about five, six years ago, it had to come down, it was falling apart. And so we had a ceremony for it. And the pieces are, so Garneau family members and, and Métis people and also neighbors all came together to celebrate that tree that Eleanor planted and the pieces are being cut up and they will be made into little trophies or other mementos. Um, I'll talk about this later in the Q&A or with Chelsea and, and Sandra, but the importance of, of uh, sort of um, multi-authored works like this, the idea of uh, making community art uh, that is, uh, yeah, distributed authorship. So this is the Tawatana Bridge that is, the bridge is almost complete. The top part I, th I saw was all done. This lower level hasn't been completed yet. This is an artist rendering, but I will have 400 paintings attached to the under part. The other, the train goes over top, pedestrians go down below. This is just uh, west or east of downtown. You'll look up, you'll see hundreds, 400 paintings. Uh, Jerry Saddleback was instrumental and many others, but Jerry Saddleback was very instrumental in helping me um, do this work. And so the thing I want to emphasize and we'll elaborate on later was this notion. I was there with some skills. I can paint. I have a whole crew of, I think we had about 20 artists in the end of every nationality you can imagine. Lots of Métis and First Nations artists too, but uh, Black and um, from India, from China, all, all sorts of people. But I would go to Jerry and I'd say, you know, like I have, I want to put these things up there. I want to honor Cree knowledge, Cree people. And he'd say, okay, okay. And so I would do something and he'd say, oh, okay. If you can do that, then I'll tell you this other story. You can do this painting. I do that painting. He said, oh, okay. I didn't know you could do that. So if you can do this, then I'll, you can do another. And so I was given permission to do all these things. Um, but I'm not, I don't have permission to tell the stories really. Um, some are very obvious connections, but others are sacred and secret. So um, we will go do a tour in the fall when they're up there and it'll, it'll never be written down or recorded. People will have to pass on the stories word of mouth. Um, another funny thing is, is, you know, like a lot of the Cree 
uh, image making was destroyed through entering residential schools and other forms of aggressive assimilation. And so as a Métis guy, I was able, I was invited to do this work and to do another project with Fort Edmonton. I only agreed to do it if they, if Terry agreed and others agreed that I, I, I could be invited rather than sort of apply kind of thing. And, uh, you know, I had Jerry come back to my studio here. He came in one time and I'm showing these things and he says, you know, David, you don't have to get permission. You don't have to show me everything. You've, you're doing it in a good way. And uh, the idea being that um, my job as an artist is to increase this um, visuality and uh, take responsibility for it. Um, anyway, so these are sometimes large pieces, about a mid-range pieces, about four feet across. This is the Edmonton knife. This is, uh, it represents Hudson's Bay blanket and Beaver Hills. There's, there's all kinds of things. This is a, a big uh, fish, the jackfish that would be in the river. But this is also that map with the uh, um, uh, Garneau um, land right there. Um, some of them are really big. This one, which has just started, is a treaty metal. It's eight feet across. Uh, some are tiny, tiny, only a few inches, all the way up to 27 feet. And there, these images are from, uh, I spent a lot of time in the uh, museum archives. There's a lot of play on digital and, and uh, quilts and beading as a form of communication. Um, Jerry's wife, <laughs> Joanne, I told her like the first image I had in a dream for that bridge right in the middle was these birds uh, flying in a circle sort of going up and down. And she said, could they be cranes? And I said, in fact, I think they are cranes. So that was, you know, one way of contributing without telling me what to do, uh, people would contribute. Um, there's hidden codes, there's literal codes like Morse code, you read that and you get a message. Here's the Red River jig on these eight foot um, bone uh, needles. This is the Garno tree again. This, I'll tell you that this feather, there's three of them and one of them has a code, a color code. I won't say the, the type, but it's got a he hidden message in it. And there are other things that are, you know, about the environment, for instance. So a kettle seems innocuous, innocuous and next to the effluent that's right coming out that river. So that's it. I'm sure I went over time, but uh, thank you for your patience. No, I think that was perfect. All right. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna hold uh, questions. I know, like I have a ton of questions now. I'm like like writing them down. Uh, but I would love to hear uh, next from Sandra. Um, say Sandra. Wow, that was really amazing. A lot of storytelling in there, and and, and I'm I'm really intrigued by by this notion of protocol. That, that's, that has this life to it, that as you, you do one thing, something more is revealed that you can do, and it continues to develop. The, um, the pieces that you've shown are amazing. Wow, David, very moving to see this work. It's gonna be an incredible experience to, to walk and see that, to be looking up that, that, that gesture of, of, of raising oneself to look up is such a powerful gesture. Um, we met at Wanaskewin uh, at your exhibit when, when, when it was opening and it was really wonderful to, to be able to experience stories being told that I did not know. And it, it had a profound impact on me in terms of my own work, in terms of telling stories that have not been told. And I'm very excited about the piece you've written about the work that's up in Regina and I'm really grateful. What I'm gonna do is um, I'm going to uh, share a screen here. Uh, the piece that I'm going to speak about uh, today is, is a piece called Understory, Overstory. And it's a collaboration with my husband, James Nicholas. And I wanted to just introduce you to James. Um, 
James was a visionary activist, an orator, a poet, and an actor, and a video multimedia artist who throughout his life advocated forcefully for indigenous language, culture, and self-determination. He was born in 1947 into the bird clan of the Nishitewayasik Cree nation of Nelson House, Manitoba. He was deeply influenced by the rock Cree oral traditions and knowledges of his family, his great grandfather, Pierre Moose, the first chief of Nelson House and, and a legendary medicine man. The stories that James told about him uh, really, really were, were extraordinary. His mother was Sarah Linklater, a gifted herbalist and a midwife for more than a hundred new lives. And his father, Lionel Nicholas, who was born in Pelican Narrow, Saskatchewan, was an exceptional trapper, hunter, coeur de bois, poet in the Cree oral tradition and a medicine man. Along with future Grand Chief Phil Fontaine, Nicholas attained, attended residential school in Manitoba a uh, traumatic experience which motivated much of his later work. Employing his skills as a writer and a negotiator, he worked with the chiefs of Northern Manitoba and the Nishichewayasik Cree Nation to strengthen governance and, and administration while also pressing federal and, fe and provincial governments on a range of issues, including land claims, fiduciary responsibility, economic development, child welfare and education. In the early 1990s, Nicholas gave away all his possessions and moved to Vancouver, where he became an actor, poet, writer, video artist, and a collaborating artist with his wife, me. Um, and I just wanted to be re really respectful of James here because uh, these are collab this is a, a major collaboration that we, we did together. Sandra, we can't see your your slides yet. You can't. No. Oh, interesting. So, have you, did you hit share screen? Uh, can you try sharing again? As something didn't work first time you tried. Okay. Okay. Now, can uh, you see? Uh, we see slides with thumbnails and. Okay. So um, if you try clicking play, it should start from the beginning. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. This should work. Yes, wonderful. Ah, oh, hi. Hi, James. Can everybody see James? Yes, we can see James. I just wanted to leave that as a moment to think about it. So this piece uh, is called Understory, Overstory. And uh, it began when James and I were driving north uh, towards Beauval uh, in Northern Saskatchewan. And we, we stopped at Canoe Lake and we went in to get some gas. And uh, uh, an old friend of mine was there over to Pikachu. He was running the, the, ga the gas station. And we were talking, exchanging, getting to know each other again, and James getting to know Ovid. And, and, uh, and Ovid says, hey, you know, that just over across the road over there is uh, the road that your dad uh, built with free workers going from between here and, and Beauval. And I said, oh. And James said, oh. And um, so we, we went over there and we looked at the road. And the road was like the plants were growing up in the road and, and it wasn't being used very much anymore. So we did this piece looking at this road and, and I'm going to, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to show the, the piece twice. And in this first showing of the piece, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, bring forward James's text uh, and, and place that in the center. So James wrote this text after we photographed the piece and did all the editing together. 
and then he he wrote the text and I, his text is is I think very very significant uh, for me and I know for other people because uh, he had this way of compressing words in, in that that opened out into many possibilities of thinking about these very difficult and fraught issues. Listen, acknowledge that we exist. And this is showing the Cree trails that were there that, that, that my dad and the Cree workers built the road over. We are not shadows of shadow cultures. We have inherent rights to the land. Ithinawuk. We place ourselves at the center. I'm going to go back now. I have to scroll. I have to scroll back. So my dad was Martin Semchuk. And he was born in 1914, just at the start of World War I. Um, at the end of World War I in, in, in 1920, he went to school for the first time and he experienced tremendous uh, racism. Uh, this was the time that the camps that held Ukrainians in Canada and, and, and other peoples from the uh, Austria-Hungarian Empire, the German Empire, and the Ottoman Empire had been were interned and forced to labor. So my dad um, really believed in 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 trying to improve conditions for people in Canada, and he worked very very hard to do that. He was a businessman. He, um, he ran a grocery store with, with my mom. They collaborated all the time with the, the, the grocery store. And, and uh, he got to know people a lot that way. And he became a, a democratic socialist. And, and um, he, was, he was really happy to have had the opportunity uh, in the early 1960s when the Medicare crisis was on to be a participant in, in developing uh, that health health insurance for, for people of Saskatchewan, and then it came, became medical insurance for the rest of Canada. But his life was threatened at that time, and uh, the family was was really frightened because there were more than once that he had, he had his life had been threatened. Um, what I'd like to do is is read uh, the text uh, on this piece goes underneath the images in final lettering, so this piece stretches between seventy seven and a hundred feet long. So I'm just gonna read his text. He found himself walking with someone who knew more about trails, muskeg. He listened, watched, and tried to understand where and how the road could be built over the wagon trail. There were places where they decided to bypass the old trail, shorten the route. At the Keeley Bridge, they checked the logs. Concerned with safety, he called to the family across the river to come and get them with their canoe. He had learned about trust. Two years later, when they brought in the cats, the men were cautious, afraid to sink the machines in Muskeg. They looked closely at the old trail and saw that the corduroy logs had in time begun to rot and had been replaced more than once. Here, he wasn't afraid to let the others know how little he knew. These Cree had no patience with arrogance gestures. 
Soon trappers used the road to return home from their camps at night, students to go to day school, for more community visiting, for runs to buy food and to buy alcohol. He actively pr promoted the north. The tourists utilized the road, then moved on further north. Outfitters with bank support found a source of income for themselves and friends. Few hired local workers. Resources went out, but little was put back in. In time, he almost forgot about his dream of developing the North, his rich mineral resources, timber, tourism. He remembered instead the steady measured walking over and around rises and wet places, startling sandhill cranes, looking around and back, seeing willows, black spruce, Labrador tea, bearded lichen and marsh marigolds. The sights and sounds of spruce grouse, raven, bear, curious caribou, but mostly he remembered the insight and the kindness of his colleagues, how they fed him. Stories and the laughter ringing through the silence and the anger. Why was he more himself with the Cree? Had he been able to reciprocate justly, he remembered getting the premier to come north to visit in the communities, to look beyond the vision that the priest offered, to begin to see the effects that the creation of a nation and a province had wrought on these lives. He said, we've done everything possible to keep these people down and we're doing everything possible we can to keep them down. Our attempts have failed and will fail. It was more than land that was stolen. It was hearts. Years later, people complained that the road that followed the animal paths that became the hunting trail, the wagon trail, the visiting trail, the trade route, the supplies road, the resource road, and the road to get to the hospital to give birth or to die was like a snake and too dangerous. A new and straightened road was built. I'm just going to go back to the beginning again. And I want to be able to um, uh, hold James's words uh, in my mouth again. Listen, acknowledge that we exist. We are not shadows of shadow cultures. We have inherent rights to the land. Ithinawak, we place ourselves at the center. So you can stop the sharing now, or I can. I guess I can. No, I can't. Uh, one second. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there more? Do you want to cover anything else right now, Sandra? Or do you no, want to? I'm fine. Hi, hi, Mr. Hay. Very beautiful. Some of those pictures, particularly at the road with all of the, the plants growing through it, it just like, I, I don't know if it's it's part of COVID and just, you know, it feels like it's been winter for a year, even though it hasn't. But I just, I just had this like moment of really intense longing seeing that, you know, it's just, yeah, it was it just sort of hit me. I was I was like, glad my camera was off. 
Um, <laughs> all right, so uh, we have some time for some questions. We actually have a fair amount of time for some questions. So knowing that we have some time, I'm just gonna go ahead and ask some first. Um, so both of your, both of your works uh, deal with a lot of collaboration, right? Um, and, you know, you're dealing with, you're dealing with place a lot. You're dealing with people and their connection to place. So what do you, what do you think is, um, you know, when, when you're trying to envision your relationship with the land uh, and you're trying to envision your relationship with other people on the land, what kind of work does that do in your mind in terms of like placing you somewhere where, when you do that work, how does it, how does that feel in your body? How does that feel for you in terms of your connection to, to land and other people? Wow. Sandra, do you want to start? Can you start? Sure. Um, it's interesting whenever, uh, when you showed that road, I was thinking to that sandy soil that's very particular to central Alberta, northern Alberta area. And it's so different than farmland type soil. Um, but it reminds me to, to answer Chelsea, your question, it's a continuous unfolding. Uh, so I spent a lot of time in the River Valley of Edmonton wandering around. Uh, sometimes I would bump into homeless people, men, always actually always men that I felt just the way I grew up, not strangers to talk to them, never, never violent, nothing ever happened. And uh, also my dad telling stories of all the different things that happened in that river. And then later, quite late in life, you know, in my forties and fifties coming across these elders who then tell me all these other layers that haunt that space. It's just this continuous coming to these layers. And it's astonishing to me that you can still find something fresh in the land. Um, I've been on those walks and oh shoot, I forgot his name, uh, McDonald from the University of Alberta uh, has brought people on and he was telling me stories about my ancestors in the very land that they lived. Um, Dwayne, Dwayne Donald. Donald? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it was this other astonishing blow and actually that story I told you that um, about Chief Papa's chase uh, that Lawrence set up that cabin for him. I only got that about four or five years ago from uh, a Chief, uh, Calvin Bruno, you know, so like there's all these things. And so knowing that you're implicated in a space is remarkable too. That, I mean, as a Métis person that you have some purchase on this land, other than the story that I thought I had that I was a suburban person or an urban person like everybody else, you're not. That it's it's this constant unfolding that I find amazing. And so it's a relationship with that actual territory over time, but also with the people there. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Beautiful. I love, I love that word unfolding and the kind of the, the multiplicity of narratives there in the land. It's beautiful. I'm thinking about um, land as... Um, the most profound of all teachers that 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 the, it's the landscape of my childhood and then subsequent landscapes that is the most deeply informed identity and particularly the relationships with the wider than human uh the 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 kind of textures of grasses the the movements of clouds the the way that the frogs croak the the movements of the white-tailed deer you know the, the the large jackrabbits we had when i was little and the smaller ones now uh the complexities of of the fact that when we can never step in that same river twice that that the there's there's constant shifts and changes in the land and in in the plants that we're seeing it's particularly when in northern saskatchewan where you clearly have four seasons it's it's really extraordinary. So James, is an, James and I, when we collaborated, um, we were always um, placing in our minds that notion of the wider than human as being the foundation of anything that we did. It, it held the space for us to do the work. So that privilege that came when, when, when Ovid said, well, over there, just over there, is, is you'll see this, this road, you know, that your dad, you know, helped to build with Cree workers. Um, it, it was amazing because then I was, I was able to locate myself 
And James similarly too, even though he was from Northern Manitoba, his dad was from Northern Saskatchewan and had been a trapper and, and a, a Cour de Bois in, in many of those areas. So that, 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 um, the, the land substances us. Mm -hmm. Literally, yeah, yeah. It's substance, it's it, it, like, what are we? We are nothing without the land. That's mm -hmm. why it's very hard within an urban environment to, to locate oneself. And, and you know, in Saskatchewan, when I go to Saskatchewan uh, and I go every year, uh, the, I'm up before the sun comes up and I'm out and I'm out there and I'm out there and I'm, I'm being witness to what's out there and, and the shift and changes as the sun comes up. And I've just started to do that here now. And, and it's changing absolutely everything. It's like, um, like I've always had some level of degree of, of, of uh, resistance to new landscapes, you know? And, 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 and that, because it's so deep, the land, the land is so deep within us. And, and in time, like I find like we become a part of the ecology of the land, you know? And we, it's very hard to take us out of it. Like I long for the land in Saskatchewan. It's it's a, it's a deep longing for mm -hmm. the land. Mm -hmm. Hi hi. Um, so I have uh, I have two more questions uh, before I, I I then open it up. I get to be selfish here as a moderator. <laughs> uh, and so in one way I want to deal with the past, and then I'm going to sort of shift things and look at the future. So. Looking at the past, both of the, the 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 bodies of work that you were both working on deal with um, a, a lot with memory, a lot with story, a lot with um, things that are not like with uncovering some of these stories. And so, David, I'm thinking particularly about the the pictures that you were talking about putting on the Tawatna Bridge there. How some of them you said you know they're they're secret. There are things there that are not going to be fully explained. Some things you'll be able to uncode in, in certain ways and other ways require you to do the work, which could mean speaking to people who hold these stories, right? Um, and I think too, Sandra, the work that you do is very much about uncovering memory from a variety of different sources and, and presenting it and asserting it in a particular way. So my question about that is, is the work that you do when you rely sort of, or, or when you enable and I don't like secrecy necessarily. I like to think of it as like requiring people to do the work to understand. I don't think it's about secrets. It's about um, asking the audience to, to invest some energy and some time into, into learning things more. Um, so there is, there's this sort of like counterforce, which is that everything should be known and available, right? There's definitely like people, people want everything to be uh, on Wikipedia and searchable if necessary. And I think that the the drive behind that, the, the need to document, archive and make everything available is this fear that knowledge will be lost. And that fear, when it when it comes to like indigenous presence, particularly on the land requires the, the belief that we will be lost, that we will be forgotten, that we will no longer exist to pass on this knowledge. So it needs to be saved and made clear for everyone or it's gonna be lost. So does that, does that sort of sense of urgency, are you fighting with it? Are you resonating with it? Like what, what is it, how does that um, impact your work? Yeah, I mean, I have an awful lot to say about that. I'm doing a series of still life paintings about, they're just books and rocks mostly. And it's about this paradox of elders who don't want to be displaced. You know, they don't want all their stories written down or videotaped because then just go to the archive rather than the living person. Uh, that's a concern. At the same time, there are elders who, especially with the climate catastrophe, want people to know knowledge about the territory because we, everyone lives at the territory and, and they've got to know this knowledge. So there's this paradox, this play. But I felt that in this public work, the Tuatana Bridge, it was really important that the knowledge be recognized as being embodied in these people. And the different elders tell the stories in a different way, a different nuance. And so these visual things are prompts and they'll, I'm hoping they'll get some surprises. They'll see something, okay, how come that's next to this? And how come there's graffiti paintings towards this side, but it changes when it gets over here and why those birds and this blah, blah, blah. I mean, there's literal codes, but there's relationships between the two and why is this being represented at all? Um, but to me, that idea of storytelling, that there will be these bodies over time 
that will tell the stories that makes it a living work of art. And for me, all Indigenous work have to have that oral embodied component, or it's just part of uh, popular culture, um, or it's trade art or whatever, you know, it's a consumable. Um, so the living uh, idea of a living archive in those bodies that are triggered by these images, that's key. And that goes back to TP liners and uh, arrangements of stones and, and all of this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Sandra. How about you? Uh, I'm thinking about the energy in in those pieces that you showed because it like it, like they're kind of electric, aren't they? Yeah, they really are. And and I'm also thinking about like when elders are telling the story that the that there's an energy that's passed and 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 perhaps the most important part is that specificity of that energy that's passed. Uh, so I'm I'm really intrigued by 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 the nuances of these pieces and and the complexity in terms of history and and shape and color and forms that are happening within and the codes that are in there and 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 i like this idea of, of um restraint in terms of giving information because one it, that that re references the the um the way that elders uh are really watching us when they're telling us the stories <laughs> and seeing what we're really absorbing, right? And to see what, you know, what will work in the next moment. And, and that's an interesting thing to try to, 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 um, to put us in that position where we're looking up and we're moving along and, and we're, we're, we're choosing what we're looking at with more energy ourselves as, as we're moving along. So that, that punctuality, you know, that opportunity for punctuality may be there. Um, I'm just, I'm just, uh, when you, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, your question and um, that the notion, I agree with you, that, uh, David, about the commodification and, and the use of information uh, that is not communication at all, that, 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 um, I'm not interested in understanding as a commodity that that James and I were in dialogue <clears throat> that we were both storytellers coming from our different cultures and and that my dad came into this with his story as well and and I'm thinking about how how vulnerable each of us was in that process that we had to be vulnerable within that process and 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 that struggle you know, as you said in your piece, David, about our work, that struggle uh, to, to reach across cultures to, to nurture each other or to help each other as counter situations to begin to understand the structures of profound violence that, that, that we are a part of and have been affected by. So um, what did it take for my dad to to change the way he changed, you know, in the story, it's talking about a change that's occurring. And recently I got a, a phone call recently within the last four years, time changes as you get older. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I got a call, phone call from a man in, in Fort McMurray and he said, oh, my dad worked with your dad on that road. And I wanted to know what his kids were like because the Cree retrained him. Oh, yeah, yeah. Fascinating, hey? Those interactions, yeah. Yeah. And I wanted to talk a little bit about James's, um, like, what he's saying there. And it, we are not shadows of shadow cultures, because I think it really relates to what you're saying. Like, if, when you have a culture that's, um, the, the, is based in the land, you know, we share that, you know. Historically, we share that we, it's a different approach to the land because we cultivate and we alter the land much more. But, but when you have a culture that's based in the land like that, then, then the respect for the land is really important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so thinking about the future, so you, you, you both do this work and, and I like that idea of layers, of uncovering layers and layers, whether they're stories, personal stories, histories of places, things like that. And, and every layer that gets uncovered is, is a bit of a, 
is, is almost like participating in a communal autobiography as well. You, you, you learn more about yourself and about your own community and the communities that your communities have interacted with. It's, it's this expansion. And now we're faced with really, really rapid changes. So, you know, you've heard, you referred uh, previously to climate change and, you know, nowhere is that more evident uh, than in the far north. Like the further north you go, you can see those changes happening more rapidly within, within lifetimes. But I mean, any of us can also just sit down thinking about where we grew up and notice the, the changes in patterns that used to be, you know, generationally stable. So much so that within our languages, like I'm thinking coming from a Nehiawe and um, Cree language perspective, the, the names of the seasons, the names of the months, all of those things um, tell us about patterns, cyclical patterns that have happened for millennia. And here we are now and those patterns no longer fit. It, it's changed in a lifetime. And we've got population shifts, the potential of mass human migration on sort of a scale that humanity has never experienced before. So what is what does this kind of rapid change do to memory? What are some of the dangers? And, and is it still valuable to engage in that work of uncovering the past when the future is just so uh, is, is so changing so so um, intensely different? Um, how, how does learning about the past help us deal with what's coming and what's happening now? Jeez, Chelsea. <laughs> Jeez, Chelsea. That's right. Just tell us, tell us how we're going to survive. Give us all the answers. <laughs> no, it's, it's a very difficult question. I have such much mixed feelings about it because I go back to Leroy Lilbear's and, and other elders teachings about the world being in flux. Mm -hmm and the danger of reifying an identity, especially this happens in Métis culture, you know, 1885, the 19th century, whatever, that's the, the, that's the beginning and the end. Whereas all the adaptation and survival, especially running through the 1930s and then to a current day has more presence for me. Um, mm -hmm. There's all these through lines, but has presence. I was working at Batosh, um, at the share, I was on the shared management board there and, working with um, some helpers. We brought all these elders and knowledge keepers together and we just rolled this roll up and when we tried to understand the park, apart from 1885, apart from the Batash uh, battle. And people were stepping up and they were filling in all these dates and things and, and the history, the Métis history is so rich in living memory and past memory and making all these connections. And so for me, it's, it's in this constant iteration, reiteration of these stories of bringing ourselves into life, coming into view, um, but always being aware that it's always been a fluid identity. What we wore, how we dressed, how we spoke, uh, where we were is very fluid. And that's true of First Nations people. There's some folks along the coast, they didn't have that same experience in the same way but they traded internationally, you know, there was, uh, I mean, so movement is very important. And uh, I was at a conference a while back in Salzburg and uh, all the indigenous people and uh, a guy from Rwanda, we were sort of in this one group and we were listening to all these climate activists talk about uh, their thing. And we sort of, we felt sick actually. And we had to all take naps. We came back and trying to figure out what was wrong. And basically, um, these uh, non-Indigenous folks from Europe uh, were telling people in, in uh, we were in North America, from Standing Rock, uh, from Standing Rock, from Rwanda, from uh, Peru, uh, they were all telling us how we should live our lives. And they were all positing this apocalypse. And, and we all realized that it was very Catholic. It was very religious and that we've all got to behave in a certain way if we're going to survive the apocalypse, you know, if we're going to go to heaven. And we were all sick to our stomachs about basically it was a, a way of reinforcing colonialism when really these folks were worried about how their conditions were going to change and become more like indigenous people of the past or present in terms of survival strategies <laughs> rather than learning from these folks. Anyways, so I have very mixed feelings about it. I, I don't. I don't direct my life among this one meta narrative of climate disaster. I find it very difficult, but I also don't take refuge in a comfortable notion of indigeneity or Métisness. I'm interested in Leroy Little Bear's notion of flux, but also resonance, responsibility, cyclical, 
things, um, learning from, anyways, I can go on and on, but um, it's, it's such a difficult question, um, mm -hmm. especially for people who are trying to center and root themselves uh, and not be unrooted. Anyway. Right. Yeah, and some of those some of those sacred stories that you reference too. I mean, a lot of them have to do with massive upheaval and change, right? So the idea that things have always been thus, I think, like as as Leroy, you know, a little bit puts it, he you know he talks about the the one constant is transformation in everything, and so yeah, interesting. And Sandra, for for that sort of like cross cultural work that that you that you've done, um, what do you think that that offers? sort of next generations um, that will be on these lands? How, how, what, what sort of guidance does it give people? Mm. And thinking to the heart of how you, how you engaged in the work, right? So what, what is the message you're trying to, you, you know, it's not just, it's not just the message itself, it's also the process. And what is that, that message? Well, the, the, one of the things that I think is, you know, that we did that, that was really helpful to us was that we were in the moment, that no matter where we were, we never knew when a piece was going to come. We just didn't know. So we were always listening and watching and seeing um, because we wanted to help and we wanted to support each other because we liked each other and we liked being together. We hung out, right? So that that process of waking up and being attentive to, to the land itself and to relationships between cultures and particularly our relationships with First Nations and Métis people. It's very, very serious that we wake up to the reality of what's happening. And I, I found when James talked about the notion of we are not shadows of shadow cultures, that, that to address your earlier question, that uh, the kind of, um, looking we're talking about unconsciousness where you've got a nation like Canada that that's saying one thing and doing another because mm -hmm. its population is acting out of the unconscious as we saw a lot of in this last year or last four years with the United States of America so the, the kind of work of uncovering and telling the stories from experience um, you know, gives the younger person an opportunity to, to be witness at something of a distance while, while, while also being, you know, experiencing some kind of penetration of, of self and, and change within the self for the opportunity for that to happen. Mm -hmm. So is, is memory work imp uh, important? I think memory work is crucial at this time. Hey, hey. Yes, I agree, absolutely. All right, I am going to uh, read out some of the questions that we got from our live studio audience. <laughs> okay, it's not actually in the studio, but um, okay. So uh, the lovely Myrna Kostash asks, uh, so my friend, the Regina writer, Trevor Harriet has written the book, Jacob's Wound in which he rages against the, plow uh, the plowman farmer slash farmer as inflicting the primary wound on land. I hope I'm not misrepresenting him, but that's what I took away. And um, I felt an immense hopelessness as a descendant of those plowmen on, on their free land. Um, is that a dead end? Is that sort of like way of thinking a dead end, do you think? Also, does it romanticize a little bit what, what happened pre-settlement? Yeah, there's a little bit of romanticism in there. I mean, I love Trevor Harriet, but I think Sandra Samchuk in one of your pieces, you've got um, well, which chief's garden, do you remember? Poundmaker's Garden. Poundmaker's Garden. And so a lot of folks pick that up and they're Indigenous people, especially in the East, who had massive gardens and gardening wasn't a problem. And part of the understanding, as I understand it, the oral understanding of the treaty was to a plow's depth. You know, the notion was that cultivation uh, could be a useful thing. I mean, uh, even the Cree were driven out of Eastern Canada, you know, they coming here, Blackfoot were here longer, but uh, the notion of, I don't rom romanticize Saskatchewan much. Northern Saskatchewan, okay, but Southern Saskatchewan, <laughs> you have to be very romantic to find romance here, <laughs> or a tree. And uh, so the notion, again, following that notion of flux, I'm not willing to leave Indigenous people uh, following only one kind of culture and uh, the notion that they might have embraced farming too. I don't see that as being a big problem. 
Obviously, the way this place is gridded up, there are more roads here than anywhere else on the planet in southern Saskatchewan. So there's no nature here where, where I live, really. It's all planted. Uh, so th that's a problem. But the notion of scarring and that, you know, we recover from scars, you know, um, there's something natural in that cycle that I, I, I don't reject entirely. I think what he's talking about, and this is central to my interest in Sandra's work too, is how do we home here when we're not from here? Mm -hmm. So how, how are, are Ukrainians, so I grew up in Edmonton at the time, no offense anybody, but it was known as Edmund Chuck and my neighborhood, the dominant culture were Ukrainian Canadians. And there are Ukrainian Canadians who are Ukrainian Canadians and there are Ukrainian Canadians who are Ukrainian Canadians. And they were all very different and it was generational. Um, but some of them long for the Ukraine. And I grew up in the Catholic Church and at least three or four times we went to services at the, I don't know if it's Eastern Orthodox Church, but the Ukrainian Church with more, even more pomp and circumstance than the um, Roman Catholics had, which was shocking to me. And uh, there was this attachment to a place not here and generational difficult of, of, of idolizing that plastic past place, which has already changed and is no longer that place anymore. So these things are, are of interest in me. So how do people home here? You know, is it by scarring and then they feel that that's their primary wound and how, how, how convenient it is to talk about the scarring the land rather than the human beings you scarred. You know, like there's a little bit of displacement uh, going on with that kind of language, I think. Although I love Trevor Harriet, he's very brilliant. <laughs> and he has a, an intense understanding of the ecosystems around this territory and a love for it that comes through his prose in a remarkable way. So I don't want to discount that. But I think about often when we're idolizing nature, it's at the cost of the human being. So a little bit of concern. Mm -hmm. I also think it's interesting, you know, indigenous peoples on the prairies, um, it, you know, engaged in, uh, in burn offs and, you know, clearing the land as well, which also a number of ecosystems rely on that in order to, to have renewal, right? There's different stages of growth after fires that, that are really, really important. Um, and there's also this idea too that Indigenous nations on the prairies didn't farm. Well, not, not in a way that was perhaps legible or obvious, you know, in, in, because uh, the notion of a particular plot of land didn't really exist. You you go the plants grow where they grow best. You don't displace them and put them in a in a in a plot of land where they're not necessarily best suited. That doesn't make sense. It only makes sense to do that if private property is really important to you. If it's a thing that you sort of base your identity on. But if if the purpose of gathering those those roots, those berries, those medicines is to propagate them to make sure that they're there for future generations, then you don't displace them, right? They grow where they grow best. And I think that that tells us something too about, about humans. Um, I think that flows well into this question for Sandra um, by uh, Troni Grande or Grand. I'm, I, sometimes I, I, I aggressively anglicize things and sometimes that's wrong. Uh, so Sandra, um, Troni says, I love the idea that the land is the most profound of all teachers. This reverence for the land reminds me of what I learned from my Ukrainian family. How would you relate Ukrainian respect for the land with indigenous ways of knowing? Yeah, um, that's a really big question. And it's just like, it's so huge. Um, one of the well, some some of the work that I've been doing now with uh, Elena Sanchenko as a mentor for her um, has been to um, be looking at the plants on the prairies that uh, are used for medicines, and and it's really interesting because like where I live, just like almost all the plants there are medicines, and it's like the, developing this. Uh, respect, you know, for the plants. And, and um, I can remember my sister-in-law, Madeline Spence, um, talking to me about how to use plants and how to be respectful and to offer tobacco to them. And, and, and when you're using them as medicine, you're using them as medicine when in, in, a, in a way that you're, you're in communication with them. 
So I remember when she had cancer, I sent her some herbs from called Isiac herbs. And she said, oh, that, they don't work. They weren't picked properly, mm. you know? Mm -hmm. So, so they're, 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 there are medicine women in Ukrainian cultures, and, and this is knowledge I'm trying to learn, because I because but this is knowledge that has been lost, you know, in, in, in my generation. So what the protocols are in relationship to the land, uh, uh, you know, for Ukrainian people, I don't know as much as I know from the teachings from, from my husband's people, because we live with them on the trap line. So um, I have to say that I, I have much to learn about that, but, but the love of the land, I mean, that's passed on to me, you know. It's, it's, you know, walking with your Baba, you know, looking for mushrooms that you can eat, you know, that kind of silence of moving through the forest and, and staring down and, and, and meeting and greeting different plants like that and taking some of them home and, and cleaning them properly and then cutting them up and, and, and making wild mushrooms with gravy on them and having them with mashed potatoes. <laughs> wow, well, so I become the land, right? You become the land, we are the land. We go, we, as James says, we come from the land and we go back to the land. It is, it, it, it's, sort of sad though that it's become um rare or or even sort of quirky for people to to have that connection to what they eat or even privileged at this point you know having access to the land it's it it has become something that has been so restricted um because of economics because of logistics geography you know class just also a whole host of institutions and oppressions and intersections so, you know, it, it has become sort of a privilege to have any connection with the land whatsoever um, for those who have through generations been sort of separated from it. Um, and so on that side, you have this, these people who are trying to regain sort of a connection to the land, but doing so in ways that don't really challenge capitalism or white supremacy or anything. And over here, you have people who never lost the connection to the land, yet who are sort of um, considered to be doing it you know, there's this, all these stereotypes about Indigenous peoples is not being intentional or not really knowing what they're doing or they're not working from a place of like scientific understanding. They're just sort of like existing, you know, um, on the land as wild creatures or whatever. So I, I always find it interesting when you see stories about um, white people, white settlers doing things uh, to, to go back, to go back to nature that gets Indigenous peoples arrested and displaced. And you can find those stories all the time. You know, you, you, the couple, the, the nice middle-class white couple who sells all their belongings to move to the bush, you know, versus indigenous peoples trying to live in the bush. <laughs> okay. So it's, it's interesting because I think there, I think there's a danger in trying to um, compare um, settler connection to the land with indigenous, like indigenous presence in the land. There's, there's an attempt, I think sometimes to say, well, they're, they're commiserate. They're the same. Um, everybody loves the land, you know. But we, we, I think we always have to remember, too, that that level of displacement, uh, physical displacement, uh, you know, displacement and, and sort of uh, ownership of resources and access and who gets to be one with the land and who doesn't is something that hasn't gone away, is very much still in play. And so when we, when we have these discussions about, you know, how do we show reverence for the land? How do we have those connections? we can't forget that colonialism is still ongoing, right? Um, all right, so Marcia Crosby asked, can either David or Sandra speak more about one, land and water, fresh or salt, and the significant ways that water was left out of settler uh, government dialogue, or, and two, more on how that aspect of our actual, like not legal, indigenous territories informs uh, our deep histories. So talking about water and land. Um, yeah, it is because the, I mean, we talk about reconciliation and everything almost deliberately does not want to talk about land, hence the land back movement right now. <laughs> so what do you think about that? I don't have too much to say. I don't know 
I'm thinking about readings in treaty negotiations. Water was pretty much there. I mean, even the notion of uh, as long as the rivers run and the grass grows, you know. Um, what I found interesting in, in work I've done looking at the various trails like the Carleton, Carleton Trail was those were uh, trails that go on time memorial, but the less recorded trails were the waterways and the waterways mm -hmm. were the ways of understanding navigating territory more than land routes. And I think that that was held by Indigenous people that knowledge for quite a long time. In working on the Tuatana Bridge, so that's a river that I, I thought I knew really well and I had done a lot of research and reading about it, but um, Jerry and other elders, um, and Dwayne Donald were telling me all these other stories and, and Jerry were telling about the spirits that live in that particular place and, and all the ceremonies around crossing uh, that, that growing up in the city, you, you don't even know that there's this whole civilization that the city's been pulled up over. I just, I find that remarkable and it includes these uh, waterways. Um, and, it, it, and it's one form of conciliation that will happen in the future will be a re reclamation of Indigenous people on those waters, right? So right now it's non-Indigenous kayakers in that space and, and others I've never seen any Indigenous people in the water, except as a kid um, on inner tubes. And they used to have the river raft race and my dad participated in that in the 60s, I recall. But uh, that uh, re-Indigenization of that waterway would be, I think, a significant thing. Um, but there's certainly a, a lot of artists working on water as being central and uh, all the stories uh, talk about it as being uh, the, the mother's milk of the land and all of that. Um, I don't know how it signifies other than that in treaty. I don't know if I can answer that question any better than that. Mm -hmm. But I like actually, and I can't remember which of the elder was talking about this, but when we were talking about building the bridge, putting the work on the bridge, I was wondering whose territory that was. Um, because it wasn't the south side, it wasn't the north side, and most of the Métis were on the south side because they wanted to align with the French Métis in St. Albert and with the Papa's Chase with the Cree on that side. And um, uh, it's nobody's land though, right? It's the space in between. And the same with the rivers. I, part of the beauty of it is it's this, you can't cultivate it. <laughs> you know, it's the space in between. So for me, it's a powerful metaphor and symbol. Mm -hmm. This coming from a city, the, the only one of two in all of North America that has no river and isn't on a lake or on the ocean in Regina here. <laughs> Anyways. Marcia, it sounds like this, there's a lot of work to be done in this area, you know, to, to go back and to look at the stories that, that still remain in community and can be told about how the water you know, were shared amongst peoples of the West Coast, for example, the ocean and the rivers and those attitudes that, that, that there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, I'm, I'm hearing you in terms of the deep notion of deep history, that that, 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 that that primary influence of the water, you're right, we're talking about land all the time and we're not talking about the waters. And, and I, think, I think you're right, they, they inform our, the deep histories and they inform the deep histories of newcomers who came to this land as well. Um, and I'm thinking about the snow in the north and, and the affects in terms of climate change on the snow in the north and the permafrost in the north. It's so huge. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't know if there was, as you're saying, in terms of negotiations of the treaties that, that where there are treaties, um, whether, whether the waters were considered. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm listening to what you're saying, David, in terms of the um, that water space is an in-between space. And wow, I mean, it's so significant, isn't it? And we think of the Great Lakes and the, and the, and the way that the, the American Canadian border goes right through the Great Lakes, right? And, and whose territory are those Great Lakes on? Yeah, really great question, Marcia. Thank you. It's good. I like, Sandra, that you're calling a distinction between land. I try to use the word territory when possible. And I always think it as um, a circulatory system and migration as territory. And so the circulatory system includes those trails on the plains, but also the river systems. Mm -hmm. Nice. And also those those river systems, as you talked about, like the rivers were our highways, right? The, the territories were bounded by, by rivers, quite literally. And rivers were often the boundaries between nations that weren't getting along. 
and crossing those boundaries led to led to all sorts of things. So you, you've got travel routes, but it's also it, it's the easiest way prior to everything being divided up into roads of getting around. It's, it's a much more rapid form of transport than, you know, uh, at the time than using, uh, you know, wagons and things like that. Um, but it's also like the easiest way for you to, to understand where somebody else's territory is, right? Um, there are a lot of great questions and we only have like two minutes left. So I think, yeah, um, there's a couple of questions about different, uh, like artists who are working on, on things, uh, particularly, you know, First Nations, Métis, Ukrainian relationships, just relationships in general. So if you, if you could do a bit of a shout out to other artists that you know that are working on subjects that intrigue you, I think that that might answer a few of these questions about who else out there is doing the work. Um, there aren't that many doing the cross-cultural ones that I know of in this kind of deep way that Sandra and James were pioneering. Um, I'm very fond of, uh, oh my God, I'm forgetting everybody's names. I know, me too. Oh, it always happens. <laughs> oh, no, I can't even talk about it. That's terrible. Oh, no. oh, I was, no. Way back when, uh, in the early 90s, there was a group called the Minquant Panchayat that uh, tried to bring Indigenous, Black, and so-called people of color together. And that's being revived by um, primary colors. So Francis Trepanier and Chris Crichton Kelly. And there's so many uh, generative relationships that have come out of that. Um, I'm particularly interested in indigenous and black relations and that's really rising up now. Um, and while the TRC calls to action is really pretty, has a thin imaginary when it comes to art, really it's, in the calls to action, it's mostly about memorialization. In the volumes themselves, it's mostly about artist healing and all that. But there is a call, and I forgot the number, where they asked the Canada Council to encourage um, uh, settler and indigenous artists to work together. Mm -hmm. And so there's that they recognize that need in the call, and that art can be a way of doing it. And, and the ways we've talked about where it doesn't become polemic, it becomes, a, well, as I've written with about Sandra's work, a, a struggle where you don't overcome colonization, but you understand and express it in a living way. Um, there are artists that, have, that are struggling with that part, but I'm particularly interested in um, not so much indigenous people with TRC, assuming that you're gonna work with European settler types, but going to all the other newcomers and people who come from other colonial situations. And, you know, I don't know tons about um, Ukrainian situation, um, but they have been under colonization too. And so those, there are ways of finding ways of meeting on the land, of course, but also through these shared senses of oppression and what we can learn from each other. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right. That that gets us to 6.30. Sandra, you want to wrap us up? Skeena Reese, Kathy Busby, Peter Morn, Ayumi Goto together. That's the one I was trying to remember. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> Peter and Ayumi's work is so gorgeous and, and uh, it's so visceral. And that's why I think of Sandra, you know, it's so affective. It's not polemic. It's you just your guts change after you watch them perform and watching it evolve that relationship evolve over time. It, that's a very beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. All right. So as much as I would love to go into all of the different questions, um, I think we're just going to wrap it up there. And uh, Brianna Barrington also threw in a link there uh, to their work. Uh, looking into Ukrainian identity on this land. But thank you so much. I know I, I really threw some like weird questions at you uh, and everything, but <laughs> you did really well. And I thought that the questions from the audience were really, really fantastic. So for sharing uh, your work with us and taking the time to have this discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, David and Sandra. And to you, Chelsea, for your thoughtful questions. They were wonderful. Uh, we do have many more. Unfortunately, we can't answer them all, but please stay tuned. We are planning another event uh, for September. Uh, join us. There will be more. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Chelsea, so much. Yeah. Good to see you again, Sandra. Good to see you. Thank you.